I come from a large family. My mother had uh, uh, 17 children, and she had had 15 children, and uh, the uh, uh, eight girls and seven boys, and uh, she was about to have another child. So my brother and I, uh, uh, we, uh, we went downtown to get away from this uh, thing because women tend to make a lot of noise when they have children. And uh, so uh, when we came back, my sisters were out on the porch waving their arms, and when I got close, my mother said, uh, or my sister said, uh, Ron, Mama had twins. And I turned to my brother and I said, there goes my place at the table, I'm joining the Army. And a week later, I, I left for the Army and became a career soldier. My first impression was that uh, everybody with a cleaner uniform seemed to be in charge. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was the, the lower part of the totem pole, so to speak. The, uh, and a little long climb up to the top again. I had got out of the Army for a short time, and my brother, uh, he enlisted, and uh, he was one of the first people into Korea, and he was wounded uh, within the first two weeks of the Korean War starting. And uh, then in February the uh, 10th, he was uh, killed in action with the 1st Cavalry Division, and I re-enlisted uh, for combat duty Korea, and the Army, uh, was very kind about it, and they sent me there. And uh, they assigned me to uh, Heavy Motor Company because I had a background of dealing with uh, 4.2 motors. And uh, my company commander told me how he was going to put me in the 3rd platoon as a first gunner. And I said, uh, no, Captain, I'm going up on line. And he said, uh, explain, you know, he was in charge, and I, I would go where he told me. And, he said, you're going to 3rd platoon. I said, Captain, I'm not going to 3rd platoon or any other platoon. I'm going online. He said, no, you're not. And I said, I can't think of a way you can stop me. And uh, so within five minutes, I was assigned uh, as a radio man for a Fort Observer. And three days later, when he went down, uh, I became the Fort Observer. And uh, I stayed uh, as a Fort Observer for uh, the, the entire year. Uh, I. I had eight radio operators and lost seven of them, and was personally wounded uh, four times myself. Well, my particular job uh, was to protect uh, men on a battalion front. I had 12, uh, 12 guns, and uh, I had the most firepower in the regiment, and the uh, uh, for the most part, I guarded the front line. Uh, but uh, when units were selected to uh, make deep penetrations, I went, I went along as a Fort Observer. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I went out the day before Christmas, was 73 of us went out, six of us got back alive, and I was the only one that wasn't wounded. The, uh, 18 days later, I went out with a reinforced rifle company, 170 men, and uh, when we got uh, uh, within a salting position of the top of the mountain, uh, the first trench, uh, we fought our way through a lot of trenches and bunkers, but uh, one of their main trenches was about uh, 15 yards from down from the top, and uh, they, uh, I led the last 35 men up against the three battalions of Chinese who were dug in there. And uh, when I got to, uh, well, the Chinese were in the trench and I was on the other side of the dirt, is the best way to explain it. And I looked back and I was by myself and all the men had been knocked down behind me. And I remember thinking, I went through a lot of trouble to get here. I no use wasting a whole day. So I let out a wild war whoop and jumped in the trench with them. And uh, I engaged a whole bunch of Chinese in close hand-to-hand -hand combat. And uh, they actually credited me with 13 in, in that trench. 
I, uh, I took out quite a few more than that, uh, but uh, the men weren't present to see it because I was up a room myself. And I finally ran out of ammunition and went back down the mountain about 35 yards to the dead and wounded and picked myself up a lot of hand grenades and as much ammunition as I could carry. And uh, went after him again by myself. And uh, I blasted my way through the second line of Chinese, uh, about a 200-man burp gun line and five heavy machine guns. And uh, I got in amongst them, is the best way to say it, and uh, engaged about 200 Chinese in close close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, they were actually jumping on my back and beat me with rifles and all kind of stuff, you know. They, uh, they, they were piling on me, is the best way to say it. And uh, I uh, beat them off of me and killed those that, uh, that you know, did, did pile on me. And uh, they, uh, Went, went across the top of the mountain. They're screaming and hollering and shooting. And uh, um, personally, I think it just kind of scared them to death. Uh, they tried. They were shooting at me from four or five feet away with submachine guns that couldn't hit me. And uh, I just charged straight into them. They're shooting, and uh, and as I'd go across the trench, I'd shoot three or four of them and keep going. And uh, the uh, I finally ran out of ammunition again. And uh, went down and, and I couldn't get any more ammunition for my carbine, so I loaded up with hand grenades and went up and uh, hit him again. And I was trying to keep him off the wounded arm. Our wounded was laying all over the side of the mountain, dead and wounded. And uh, they were trying to bunch up to slip down and kill our wounded. And uh, the, the purpose of me doing all that crazy stuff was really to stop them from doing that. The, uh, and uh, they, uh, I engaged a lot of Chinese again, and they uh, broke up their attack. And uh, finally, I got back to the company commander, and he was badly wounded, and told him, I said, Captain, if you, if you don't get your people out of here, you're going to lose them all. And so he asked me to take them out. So I organized the men and, and uh, had the walking wounded, dragged the dead and wounded out. And I picked four men to hold hold the Chinese off until they were all wounded men too. Uh, hold the Chinese off until uh, we could get our people out. And uh, finally, we got everybody out we could find. And one of the boys came up and told me we said we got everybody we can find. So I said, told the kids, I said, let's get the heck out of here, boys, before they get us. And so we uh, we get up. And, started walking down the mountain, and the Chinese never fired another round at us. And people said, uh, why didn't they shoot at you again? I said, personally, I think they was glad to see us leave, <laughs> the, <laughs> because we was causing a lot of trouble with them. Uh, and uh, three days later, they recommended me for the Medal of Honor. They, uh, I personally didn't even know what it was. They, it was just, just a medal, and I had no idea, had no idea of value or really what it was. Uh, so when I finished my tour uh, year, I, uh, they sent me to Washington and President Truman presented me the Medal of Honor. Uh, basically what happened, the, uh, uh, I didn't, I'd never done anything heroic. I, uh, all I was trying to do was protect the men that I was responsible for. The, uh, uh, and that's what I did, best I could. Uh, well, the first thing he said, uh, uh, he said, the, the bright lights I hear is killing my eyes. He said, I'm going to put on my uh, uh, specs from uh, down in South you know, down on the Keys, uh, they, they wore down there and uh, kind of tickled us, you know, the president had to change his specs to get her to read her citation. And uh, then uh, he told us, he said, uh, I'm not sure you fellows know what's happening to you, but he said, uh, he said, you're, to receive, you're receiving the Medal of Honor. And he said, uh, uh, personally, 
I'd rather receive that than be president. Uh, but uh, I think he said that to a lot of people. Uh, he, uh, uh, but uh, uh, he talked to us for quite a while and finally said that he uh, had to go back to the Oval Office to take care of some business and told us to, to stay in place and, and to be interviewed. And uh, some elderly gentleman walked up to me and he, and he said, uh, uh, Sergeant Rossler, he said, You're, uh, uh, you have the Medal of Honor. He said, from this day on, he said, uh, all officers uh, are required to salute you. And I said, you kidding me? <laughs> Never heard of such a thing, you know? And he said, I'd like to be the first to salute you. And I, well, excuse me, I was a corporal then. And he said, uh, Corporal Rossler, I'd like to be the first to salute you. And he saluted me, and I returned to salute and uh, I always felt good about it because his name was Omar Bradley. The, uh, uh, but, and my whole family was there watching this thing. Uh, you know, I'm the oldest son of 17 children and all of them that was alive there was there to see it. And including my mother and dad and grandmother and grandfather. And uh, uh, it's kinda, kinda scared me to think, you know, that all this honor was going to come on me, and, and my greatest fear would I do something that would bring dishonor upon what was happening. So I, uh, I sat down and kind of, when it was over, sat down and kind of decided, you know, that whatever I do, I'll, I'll never violate the honor. And uh, I've tried to do that through, you know, the rest of my life. They, uh, I guess, and I w ended up as an instructor at the parachute school, and uh, this thing come along here, the barrel of the unknowns, and uh, I was the first one selected to uh, be a body bearer, and I was selected by the Secretary of Defense, Mac Mr. McNamara, uh, to be the body bearer of the unknowns, and to present the flag of the unknown soldier to the Vice President Rich, Richard Nixon. And uh, now that, unknown to me that all that was decided before I left Fort Benning, Georgia. The uh, uh, kind of an interesting thing, you know, to be in a place like this and watch this happen. The, uh, a lot of people made mistakes and we covered them up. The, uh, just like the president putting the Medal of Honors on the, laying them on the flag, American flag, and you don't do that because they had little, little stands to lay the flag, or the medals on, and for some reason he laid them on the, laid them on the caskets, and our people just moved in like, like, like it was planned, picked them up, put them where they were supposed to be, saluted, and went back to their place beside the president. And nobody never knew the difference. The, <laughs> so uh, uh, we uh, prepared ourselves for about anything uh, you know that might happen, and uh, a lot of things did happen. The, uh, they trained us with uh, caskets full of sand, and there was so much sand in there we couldn't even carry the casket. And we made him take this, finally made him take the sand out because the bodies, were, you know, were just a handful of bones mostly. And uh, they, uh, so uh, we made him take the sand out there and, and uh, so we could make it look good uh, before the public. Because uh, the in World War I, uh, uh, the, they, the, the casket was moving in all kind of directions and. Uh, we made sure that the casket stayed level at all times. The, uh, and, uh, uh, it was quite an experience, probably the greatest experience of my Army career. The, uh, I, even, I even felt stronger about being selected to be the body bearer of the unknown than I was to receive the Medal of Honor. They brought us up the 1st of May of 1958, 
and uh, the ceremony took place the 30 May 1958, and we, we rehearsed every aspect of uh, what was going to happen. And uh, the, uh, long before the bodies were brought in, and then they had a selection cere ceremony from all over the world. Uh, they, uh, they went to all the, the cemeteries in Europe and selected several unknowns and then one, one of our people went over and selected one of them, and uh, uh, the rest of them were reburied. Uh, then he was loaded on a destroyer, came across the Pacific uh, to uh, the Panama Canal. At the same time, they went through all the World War II cemeteries in uh, the Pacific, and they selected several who were unknowns, and they brought them out and one of our people selected one of those and the rest of them were reburied. Then uh, and they selected an unknown from the Korean War and from different, different cemeteries, even in Hawaii. And we kept moving all the bodies around, uh, different groups of us, until nobody knew, uh, like in World War II, even what part of the world the body came from. Uh, and uh, we moved the Korean body so that nobody would know what cemetery it came from. And uh, then uh, uh, one of our people made the final selection of the unknown of World War II, and uh, the, the second one was buried at sea. Uh, so uh, then they brought him into the Navy shipyard, and we picked him up by then and took him to the Capitol. And, uh, World War II was placed on the Lincoln catafalque, and uh, the, uh, the next day, uh, one of our teams went over and changed him over to the Korean body to the Lincoln catafalque, and then the next day we went back and moved, to, moved uh, World War II back to the Lincoln catafalque, and uh, uh, then got ready to bring the bodies from uh, the Capitol into uh, Arlington National Cemetery, and uh, we walked the whole way uh, the, uh, with the bodies. I had the World War II body up until the final internment, then they moved me over to the Korean bodies so I could make the presentation to the Vice President. Uh, it's kind of the way it went. Uh, the, uh, it was well planned, other than uh, uh, the colonel who commanded the old guard, they, they selected 19 of The Secretary of Defense selected 19 of us from all the different services. And uh, the colonel told us that he was going to pick 12 of us out of the 19 and send the rest of them back. And I put up my hand and he said, uh, yes, Sergeant Officer. And I said, sir, we've, we've already talked this over and uh, uh, it's a very important thing in our life and we all want to participate. So we're all going to participate in this thing. And he, uh, he said, Sergeant Rusher, we've already made plans to send some of you people back. And I said, uh, well, sir, uh, when he told me, he said, if I opened my mouth again, he was going to send me back to Fort Benning. And I said, well, I hate to mention this, sir, but if you, you cut orders on me, you have to cut 18 other sets of orders. And, and he said, what do you mean? And every one of those men stood up and said, if you send any of us back, you send us all back and make another selection. And we'd already been selected by the Secretary of Defense, McNamara, and uh, the Colonel uh, was a little upset, but he left and 15 minutes later he came back and he said, it's been decided you all shall participate. And uh, so the, uh, uh, from that time on, we were in charge. Uh, nobody else was allowed to touch them or even get near them. And uh, so we took care of everything, and it was done right. The, uh, uh, we were in the Capitol, and uh, when the first howitzer fired, we picked up the bodies, carried them down the steps of the Capitol, placed them on the uh, uh, 
on the gurneys uh, for the walk to uh, Arlington. And as we, uh, as we came through this one area there, they had all the, uh, they had all the uh, 105s there firing blanks. And every time, and they fire a blank every, one, every minute. And, when, <laughs> and every time they'd fire a blank, them horses would jump about six feet in the air, you know, and almost, almost knock you down. And we, uh, we had a lot of trouble try, keeping the horses under control. And, but we finally got that done too. And uh, uh, we actually put a feed bag on them there so that they would uh, give them something to think about besides the, the guns going off. Uh, yeah, my best way to say it, we were prepared for about everything. I uh, wanted to make sure it went right, because uh, it was a great honor to be selected for this. Early in the afternoon, if I remember, uh, somewhere between noon and two o'clock, I would say, uh, and uh, once we once we presented the flags, uh, we were dismissed from the uh, because our part of the ceremony was over. The, uh, then the next day, uh, because we wanted to be part of this ceremony, uh, we. Uh, change protocol is the best way to say it. And uh, the 19 men uh, paid for uh, uh, plaques and we presented, had a big ceremony here at Arlington with all the honor guards and everything. Uh, the head of the military district of Washington, the chiefs of staffs so of everything, Congress and everybody was here. and. Uh, we presented plaques to the head of the cemetery. Uh, we who carried you to your final resting place, you know, carried you with honor. This type of thing. Uh, I'm not sure what all it said. It was a long time ago, but we tried to make that impression that uh, uh, we we felt it was a great honor. The, uh, uh, we selected, per personally, we selected those men who were best uh, qualified physically uh, to make the march and to carry the caskets. Those men that who had been badly wounded, some of the Medal of Honors and some of the other people, uh, we gave them the other, other jobs to do so they'd, they'd feel part of it, like bringing the men off the ship out here at the shipyard and moving, moving the men from the different catapults and so forth, and uh, uh, other little things that, uh, that needed, needed to be done, and we had them do it. And uh, the ones that, who were in the best physical shape, because uh, most of us had been badly wounded in one time or another, and uh, uh, we, uh, we selected the, the uh, 12 who were best physically qualified to make the march and, and to uh, uh, take care of the, uh, all this stuff. But uh, the presentation itself uh, uh, was already pre-planned. A master sergeant named Ernie Kuma from the Korean War, uh, World War II and the Korean War made the presentation President Eisenhower, and uh, uh, he went over and made the presentation. And uh, as he turned, saluted and, and turned to walk away, uh, the flag was handed to me, and I, I made the turn. And as he stepped from the vice, the president, I moved to the vice president, and made my presentation. It was all like clockwork, and we rehearsed it uh, for a month to do this stuff because uh, we wanted to make it look good. Yeah, I, uh, I said the same thing you would say to the next of kin, you know, the, 
sir, uh, this is the flag of the unknown soldier. And uh, 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 I mentioned honor and so forth, and uh, uh, the flag is now in your custody as the next of kin of the unknown. Uh, something of this nature is, is the way we put it. And uh, uh, made the presentation, saluted very slowly, and took about, you know, stepped backwards about a face and went back to our position uh, on the uh, grave. Um, and, uh, but it, it was a well-rehearsed thing. And uh, the ones of us that were selected made sure that it was done right. Uh, in fact, we even pretty much took control of it from uh, the old guard who was responsible for it because uh, we didn't want to make a mistake and we wanted to keep as many people out of the process as we could, uh, you know, to cut down on any mistakes that might, be, might take place. It's kind of interesting, a bunch of sergeants, you know, uh, was telling colonels and generals this is the way it's going to be. Uh, the, uh, I was kind of the ringleader of that group. Because uh, it was a great honor, and I, I personally wanted it to be done right. As you get older, the, uh, then you realize, you know, what you've done and survived it. The, uh, the, you realize that you carry a, an honor that represents a lot of people. It doesn't represent you. Uh, you just happen to be there uh, in the process of doing this stuff. But uh, in my case, almost every man, we had a, if I remember, 100 or 90 men killed and 12 missing in action and 68 wounded. Every man was killed, wounded, or missing with my group, my company. And uh, uh, what I done uh, was represent my company uh, and the men who served with me. The, uh, uh, I didn't do anything that they didn't do. Uh, I just was lucky enough to survive it. The, uh, that's the way I've always felt. The, uh, I represent Love Company, the 38th Infantry. Uh, they, uh, and most of us feel that way. We represent uh, the people that were with us that didn't make it uh, because they tried the same thing we did to do their job. Uh, the, uh, Korea was a very nasty place anyhow. And outnumbered 10 to 20 to one. And the, uh, in our case, we had 100 170 men, and we took on three battalions of Chinese in close combat. The, uh, uh, not the kind of thing you'd want to do every day. They were dug in, and we were coming after them in the open. They just cut us to pieces. The, uh, but uh, I feel I just represent Love Company to the 38th and uh, what they tried to do that day, uh, which was their job, what they were assigned to do. Uh, and that, that particular job happened to be to put the enemy out in the cold, destroy his, in, and destroy his winter installations. Uh, and we did a lot of that. But uh, uh, we didn't get, didn't get a lot of it because it was all over the mountain. The 19 of us from all the different services, it was kind of interesting. Uh, the, uh, the, the other NCO that was on my team uh, went on to become the Sergeant Major of the 101st Airborne. Uh, the uh, young Marine who uh, was on my team became the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. Uh, the, uh, uh, everybody seemed to 
uh, move into higher, you know, do well is the best way to say it. The, uh, uh, I, was, I was crippled up and I went on recruiting duty and uh, became top recruiter in America at one time. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and because of my involvement in uh, this particular assignment and, the, and my assignment with uh, uh, the, the barrel of uh, Alvin York and uh, uh, other things I was involved in, I was selected as the outstanding soldier of the American Army, which I thought was kind of silly. You know, the, uh, uh, they could have just as easy picked anybody to do the same thing. I just. Uh, I was always seemed to be lucky and get interesting assignments. The, uh, and uh, uh, I've had the honor of being at the White House under every president since Franklin Roosevelt, and most of them many times for different reasons. And uh, uh, I always wonder when the honors will cease, I guess when they bring me to the cemetery. The, uh, I know when I was here, the uh, Arlingtons uh, said they were going to hold a place open for me just down below the Tomb of the Unknown, and, but I decided I'd be buried with near, near my family, so uh, uh, this will probably be my last time that I that come to Arlington. The, uh, I've seen most of it. Uh, you visited the museums and seen the things that we left behind. And, uh, but I always remembered it was uh, what an honor it was to be able to do something like that. The, uh, and every man that was with me felt the same way. Just the opportunity to, to participate uh, changed the way you thought about everything. Uh, I always remembered all my life, you know, that, that was, I was part of it. And uh, I tried to keep in touch with a lot of the people that were involved in it. Uh, but uh, others, some of them were killed in action, and some died. And the, uh, as far as I know, I'm the last, the last of the body bearers, the unknowns. <laughs>